it started you just yeah cool all right so thanks for tuning in guys this is going to be a lecture on the geopolitics of the middle east so let me tell you what this is lecture is going to be about and what it's not going to be about i think the middle east sorry i'm echoing through someone's mic is anyone, everyone muted I don't know who, well, we'll see if it comes back. Uh, Alo, I can see you are unmuted, so. Okay, great. Uh, right, so this lecture is gonna be about the geopolitics of the Middle East. Now, it's, it's obviously not gonna be all the geopolitics of the Middle East, and I'm gonna flag the major omission, which is Israel-Palestine. That, despite being a relatively small conflict, is probably a bigger topic of debate than a lot of the stuff in this lecture. But as I've said in the chat, but for those of you watching, there is a very good lecture, if you go and search it up now, by Ayal, Ayal Hayudman, on Israel-Palestine. It's about an hour and a half long, and I think he gives it a better summary than I could do. But also, the fact that it exists means I won't you know, waste my time, and I can instead focus on things that have been talked about a little bit less. And the, re the value of this lecture, I think, is that a lot of the conflicts that you read about in the Middle East these days can be boiled down into two points of discussion. One is the historical Sunni Shia split within Islam, and the other is a, a, a consequence of that, which is that the uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia, the two biggest powers within the Middle East, essentially drive both ideologically and also in terms of resources a lot of the conflicts that you hear about in the news today. So this lecture is going to focus on those two actors. It's going to talk about the history of the of the region through the lens of those two actors. Cool. I see Franca's joined us now. Uh, so uh, Franca is going to chime in at various points, probably to correct me on some of my simplifications of uh, Iranian history and just generally be the fact checker for this, which is quite nice. Uh, so, cool. So let's progress. Uh, how does this, why, how do I, here we go. What is the Middle East? Uh, stupid question, but one that probably benefits from an answer. The term is used to encompass a lot of regions that aren't technically part of the Middle East. So you'll often hear people talk about the Middle East and you'll hear Libya or Egypt come up, which are not technically part of the Middle East. Actually, it's essentially a, more of a geopolitical term than it is a geographic one. And it's essentially these majority Muslim nations in West Asia, North Africa. And it originates uh, from the Near East, which was, as, as you can read on the info slide, was the Balkans and the Ottoman Empire. So the Ottoman Empire was, we're going to talk about them a little bit, but it was essentially a giant empire that spanned this entire region and was majority Muslim, although it contained within it lots of um, sort of different ethnic and religious communities. And so really, the two have sort of blended together. So yeah, as I said, the Ottoman Empire was a powerful caliphate. Uh, for those of you not familiar, maybe you've heard the term before, a caliphate is, is uh, an idea from sort of Muslim, uh, sorry, Islamic political theory, which is the idea that uh, there should be an empire, essentially, of Muslim people, which should spread Islam to the entire world. It, the, the idea sort of uh, originates in the days of Muhammad and has sort of had a resurgence recently in sort of arguably more toxic light in the, the formation of the Islamic states, supposed the caliphate. And so the Ottoman Empire was the last, the only real caliphate that has ever seriously existed in the modern era, and it spanned the regions that you can see here on the maps. At the end of the First World War, the Allies uh, sort of divided up the region, uh, in, as you can see in the map on the right, and they previously, this because this has been under control of a single sort of political entity, the notion of borders and divisions between different peoples, different ethnic groups, had largely been non-existent. There wasn't the notion of nation states in the region to, near, to the extent that we understand now, for example, in Europe, etc. Modern day, for, for reference, for those of you who don't know, modern day Turkey is the closest thing to a successor state to the Ottoman Empire in the sense that it, operate, it operates within uh, the same sort of original region and the closest ethnic successor as well. The partition of the Middle East is where a lot of the problems. So what I want to stress here is that while the Middle East is a source, it is a region of immense conflict and it's sort of you hear about in the news is you know, people constantly fighting, lots of ethnic and ideological division. Uh, it, but this is not because some, there's just something wrong with the area. It's not because the people there are just naturally more prone to war. It's essentially a consequence of long running like geopolitical mistakes or Perhaps mistakes is the wrong word because that implies people didn't know what they were doing. Essentially, the British and the French screwed up the Middle East quite substantially when they divided up the region after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. So during World War I, local Arabs in the region, who perhaps were not so friendly to the uh, Ottoman Empire, or perhaps just saw this as a route towards the creation of a pan-Arabic state, talk about that a little, in a little bit, 
Uh, they assisted the Allies against the Ottomans. Uh, note, Turks and Arabs are not the same thing. Uh, and in cooperation with the British, and they were, they were promised that this, the British would then assist them after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in the formation of a pan-Arabic state. So this would have spanned a lot of the territory that I discussed in the Middle East previously, although it obviously would not have included Turkey. Countries like Egypt would have been included in this. Uh, the, the British did not keep their word, uh, as has often been the case in geopolitics and in history. The British, as soon as you know, the war was over, in a secret treaty, the French and the British, two diplomats, sykes Pico, as a terminology worth remembering. Uh, I forget which one was the French one, which one was the British one, but between them, they basically uh, sat in a dark room and divided up the Middle East. They more or less just drew straight lines on the map. So if you look at that map on the right, you'll see that like the border between Iraq and Saudi Arabia or with Jordan is particularly jagged and doesn't seem to have a lot of sense to it. Uh, compare that to, for example, the border in Israel, which is a little bit more organic. So the border in Israel is a consequence of repeated wars and territory grabs and so on. Uh, the border in the rest of it was lit quite literally Sykes and Pico drawing lines on the map, arguing over who'd get which river, who would control which city and so on. And this is what they came up with. The critical thing is that they, these boundaries had no connection to the existing people that lived there. There was no division on the basis of ethnic, religious, cultural boundaries, nothing. So in the case of Iraq particularly, what you were looking at was essentially a wide array of different um, tribes. And I don't mean that in the derogatory sense. I mean that these were groups of people who existed in sort of informal um, neopolitical structures that, that weren't uh, organized around the idea of a central state. There was more sort of localized systems of governance. That's what's meant by tribes. And as a result, Iraq is basically the mishmash of, I forget the exact number, it's like 80 plus different cultural groups that were just forced together into uh, the formation of a new state. So the, the, the British and the French didn't really stop there. They also installed pro-Western puppet governments in a lot of these. And then, as particularly as sort of the century progressed, oil became more and more important. And it became increasingly an issue of concern in geopolitical strategy in the West. Because if you controlled the Middle East at this point and you had governments that were amenable to you or would support you, that meant that you had access to the supply of oil. And this would become immensely critical. So this is important to understand. The reason why I've spent so much time on this is that this is a large portion of where the hatred that exists in a lot of Middle Eastern states towards the West exists. So it's sometimes thrown around in debates that, oh, people in the Middle East hate the USA because of drone strikes or because of the Iraq war or something like that. And it's important to understand that a lot of this, this anger originates much, much beyond this, right? It, this, this, this stuff goes back a really long time. And in the absence of the USA's geopolitical deci uh, interventionist decisions in the last you know, decade, uh, the Middle East would probably still not look particularly favorably onto the USA regardless. So that, to some extent, tells you why the Middle East is divided in the way that it is now and why they're not particularly fond of the West. But it doesn't tell you why, where a lot of the internal divisions uh, that persist today are. So you can broadly split the Middle East into two ignoring Israel and Palestine, you can, you can split them into two groups, right? And they, this is a huge simplification, and I don't want to give the impression that there isn't divisions and ideological tensions within these groups. But in terms of geopolitics, this, this is the two groups you need to consider. It's the Sunni Shia schism, and this goes back even further than the intervention of the British. This goes back to the era of Muhammad, and in the, in the event of his death, there was no clear leader. And so it split into two factions, one with his father-in-law, one with his son-in-law. And they were essentially disputed the theological differences that, would, that arose within Islam at the time, as well as the political differences. So it's important to understand that unlike Christianity or even Judaism or almost any other religion in the world, Islam was not simply a theological doctrine. It was also a political one. It was also an economic one. So the, the, the Quran and the Hadiths tell that the followers of Islam not just how they should organize their religion, but also how uh, like economically things should be. And wait. Just want to put up the chat because I see it flashing. Um, you can unmute yourself, Franco, but let, let's wait till we get to the end of the slide and then you can make the corrections. It'll probably feel a bit more cohesive in that regard. Cool. Um, so, okay, actually, yeah, I am at the end of the slide. So, do you want to unmute yourself and chime in now? Okay, well, I, I'm going to move on. So, the Two most powerful successor states to uh, the Ottoman Empire that arose uh, were Iran and Saudi Arabia. And the importance of these two, aside from the, the, their, their, the, the immense power, they have large populations, they have large... <laughs> what was that? 
Okay. I don't know if anyone else heard that. I have uh, no idea, but yeah, I think things are going to press on. So, so, so the, the, the importance of these two states is that Iran is uh, overwhelmingly uh, Shia Muslim and the yeah, okay, so sorry. So the correction that Franco wanted to offer was that the, the division is, is institutional and organizational. So they both, broadly speaking, the religions don't disagree too much theologically. Um, that, you know, they both believe in Allah, they both believe in Muhammad and, you know, essentially accept the, the Quran as, it, as it's written, but it's it's more of a disagreement on the, the sort of uh, organizational structures of Islam. So, uh, yeah, so uh, Turkey also exists, but I'm going to largely pull Turkey out of this because Turkey is one a less active player across the entire Middle East. So while Turkey is immensely powerful, both militarily and economically, uh, they don't intervene outside of their immediate region to nearly the extent that these other two do. Um, and also Turkey is an ally of the West, like in, in a much more realist, real sense than even Saudi Arabia. So Turkey is a member of NATO. Um, there are lots of NATO bases within Turkey and historic, until actually relatively recently. Turkey was a really, like an extremely close ally of the West. So Iran is the de facto leader of the Shia Muslim world, and they hold strong alliances with uh, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq. Uh, that one's interesting. It's in a bit of flux at the moment. And, and to some extent, Russia. The, the, to some extent is that Russia essentially allied itself with all of the Middle Eastern geopolitical players that the USA didn't, and the USA picked Saudi Arabia. So by default, uh, Iran uh, became an ally of the Soviet Union, and that has largely persisted throughout to this day. So Saudi Arabia is the leader of the much larger Sunni Muslim world. So approximately 85 to 90% of global Muslims are believed to be Sunni, or some, some form of Sunni Islam. There's lots of subdivisions even within Sunni Islam, but they all agree with each other sufficiently that the theological tensions amongst these nations don't arise. So Pakistan, for example, is uh, Sunni Muslim. So Saudi Arabia's influence extends far outside the Middle East, whereas Iran's religious influence extends only really within the Middle East. So the USA, as you probably all know, holds especially close ties with Saudi Arabia. So uh, let's talk about Iran first. Pre-World War II, it was not actually, uh, oh, sorry, not pre-World War II, but historically Iran was not a Muslim country. Uh, it was a Zoroastrian, I always struggle to say this, Zoroastrian. So if someone wants to chime in and say how you're supposed to pronounce that, I've always struggled with it. But it fell to the Arab Muslim conflict, uh, uh, conquest, and it was converted to Islam. So during World War I, the British occupied much of Western Iran, and Russia occupied Northern Iran. But the British um, withdrew, and they supported a military coup, and this eventually led to the formation of the imperial state of Persia. So the dual influence of both the Soviet Union and Britain, i.e. they both were active within Iran, meant that in World War II, they were both sort of drawn into the region. Uh, in 1943, uh, there was a conference in Tehran, the USA, the UK, and the USSR issued something called the Tehran Declaration, which is when the modern independent state of Iran really comes into existence. And this guy, uh, Mohammad Mossadegh, was appointed prime minister. Uh, he was extremely popular because one of his first actions was to nationalize Iran's oil industry, which had previously been essentially invested in and owned almost exclusively by British companies. So these British companies were not only controlling the distribution of oil, they were also getting most of the profits. They did employ Iranian people, but that meant that almost all of the profits of what at this point was an extremely important industry were not being kept within Iran. So this was, Iran was relatively poor. So this guy came in and he nationalized the oil industry and started spending the revenue on the Iranian people. He was also a champion for secular democracy and he was you know, gradually liberalizing the country, at least within the context of what it meant to be liberal in the 1950s. As you might imagine, the British were pretty unhappy about this. So they uh, essentially launched a coup to depose him and replaced him with this guy, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, uh, aka the Shah. So if you read about Iran, um, you'll often hear about references to the Shah. This guy was a brutal dictator. He was really not a good guy, especially compared to um, Mossadegh, who was very popular before him. Um, but he ruled for decades and he sort of restored the alliance of Iran with the West. And that meant also a lot of the oil profits were going flowing back now to the West. This essentially created a bit of a power vacuum in the sense that, not power vacuum in the sense of the governance of the country, but it meant that he was extremely unpopular and Iran was not at this point, had, had, you know, there, there was still, it was still a relatively liberal country and there was still a lot of dissent amongst the population. This meant that eventually someone was going to come in and be the voice, the spokesperson essentially for the dissent against the Shah. As history transpired, this ended up being Rahala Khomeini. So Khomeini is another big name in Iranian history. 
and uh, he was a radical Islamist. Uh, Islamism, by the way, means uh, a political belief in Islam. So it's the idea that it's not enough for you to be Muslim, you also should uh, strive for the, the political and economic structures that I talked about within Islam to be reflected in your state. So a radical Islamist means not someone who's very Muslim, it means someone who is both very Muslim and thinks that that should be the blueprint for the state. So he became the catalyst for the popular movement because he was very outspoken and very, he, he essentially embodied a lot of the anger that people had against the Shah. And he was so threatening to the Shah's regime that he ended up being exiled for 18 months. Now, if you've watched, if you've seen electoral authoritarianism, you'll understand that it's often not politically palatable for dictators, even really brutal ones like the Shah, to just kill people who oppose them because this guy was very popular and killing him would have turned him into a martyr. So it was more in the interest of the Shah to push him out of the picture, which is why he was exiled. Uh, now, the Shah kept the country stable, even if people didn't like him. And so again, if you've seen my authoritarianism lecture, you'll know that stable dictatorships tend, like as long as people are fed and like the economy functions, people will tend to not revolt. But in the 1970s, uh, the economic situation starts to deteriorate in Iran quite substantially. And this means that now people aren't, uh, you know, the government's not fulfilling their end of the grand bargain, as I called it. Their, people were starting to starve, people were, you know, couldn't find jobs, things were really deteriorating. And in 1979, uh, Khomeini comes back into the picture, the Islamic Revolution happens, they overthrow the Shah, and they, the formation of the new Islamic Republic, as it's known now, um, is created. Uh, the new Islamic Republic is created, and Grand Ayatollah Rahala Khomeini becomes the Grand Ayatollah. So, uh, the, there was two referendums. The one that, that formally, you know, the people consented for Iran to become an Islamic Republic, and the second one is to approve the theocratic constitution. So this is, again, um, I'll, I'll stop referencing it, but a theocracy is ruled by a religious elite. Let me just see if there's... Uh, cool. All right, so modern leaders. Uh, the, the structure of uh, Iran is that you have um, the supreme leader, who, as I said, is a dictator maybe is I think gives the wrong impression. The supreme leader is known as the, the guardian of the revolution. So he has the final word on all issues of governance within Iran. He can override literally anyone within the country. He has the power to have the final word on almost anything. In practice, he doesn't actually do this. Uh, in practice, the country is, a lot of the country is governed on a day-to-day -day basis by the parliament, which is led presently by Hassan Rouhani. Um, note that the Ali Khomeini is not to be confused with uh, Rahala Khomeini. They're spelt differently and they are different people, um, just in case that was confusing people. Um, cool. So the Supreme Leader is uh, also head of the armed forces. The parliament has almost no power over the military, but uh, the parliament does have quite a lot of power in the sense that they, one, actually manage the country and liaise with the civil service and um, you know, they're elected by the people, they have a lot of legitimacy, they implement the constitution, uh, they implement a lot of the executive power. So a lot of the time, the Supreme Leader will, 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 he won't issue through actually issuing new laws. He'll simply say, I would like for this to happen. And it's the job of the parliament to make that happen. So both of these figures are important. Both of them are powerful. In theory, Ali Khomeini is the most powerful. In practice, Hassan Rouhani also has a lot of power within the country. So modern Iran, let's talk about the politics now. So they have this thing called the Guardian Council, which is a committee of extremely powerful, typically religious figures who are appointed by the Supreme Leader, i.e. Khomeini, the one I talked about before. And their role is essentially to scrutinize the people who run the country in the, in the most literal sense. So they don't tend to engage in much actual governing, but what they do is watch other people who are governing and make sure that they're not letting down the country or betraying the revolution, as it's commonly taught termed. The Consultative Assembly, which is their parliament, is 290 members and they're elected on a four-year cycle. And in a lot of sense, this looks a lot like the parliaments that we have in Europe or much around the rest of the world. The key difference is all the bills that they pass, all the treaties that they ratify, everything, the budgets they approve, all of this has to go through the Guardian Council. This is what I said, but the Guardian Council kind of watches other people more so than they actually govern themselves. Now, the Iranian military is, I think, probably one of the most interesting things. And once you understand how the military is set up and the internal powers within that a lot of what you hear in the news suddenly becomes you understand how little these people know what they're talking about because iran when we talk about when people talk about the iranian military that, that doesn't really mean anything so that there's two branches or two big sectors of the military that we can talk about the first one is the, the regular military it has you know the, the normal branches of the army the navy and the air forces so this was the successor to the military that existed in iran prior to the 1979 revolution the other part of the military, which is the one that's typically doing stuff when you hear the Iranian military did this or Iran did this, 
is the Islamic Revolutionary Guard. So they are essentially a subset, a separate entity to the military. They're smaller, but they have very different sets of specialties and powers. And they report directly to the Supreme Leader and to the Guardian Council. The Islamic Revolutionary Guard specializes in uh, asymmetric warfare, but also they are, um, there's a, lot, there's a lot of members of the Iranian National Guard, sorry, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard, who are not sort of soldiers per se. A lot of them are uh, morality police, things like that. But between them, so, so the Iranian, sorry, Islamic Revolutionary Guard, IRGC, uh, has millions of members, but not all of them are active. But between these two forces, Iran has an enormous army. It's impossible to overstate just how militarily powerful Iran is. So this is often not captured in a lot of the discussion of international news. People sometimes make comparisons between, for example, Syria and Iran, and this is just not, not remotely appropriate. Iran is huge and its military is extremely well equipped. Um, it's extremely sophisticated militarily as well. So again, a lot of people have this idea of you know, guys in scarves wrapped around their heads holding AK-47s. This is completely at odds with the way the Iranian military looks. They actually have an incredibly uh, well-developed domestic technological sector. So there's an incredible amount of research that goes on within Iran. Their universities are very good. They lead the world in many fields. And also because they're very independent from both their neighbors and the global community, i.e. we'll talk about Saudi Arabia in a little bit and how they buy their weapons from other countries. Iran largely manufactures a lot of their own stuff. Uh, and the stuff they don't manufacture is um, bought from Russia. They also, again, if you look at this map here, they have an incredibly, I'm gonna stop saying the word incredibly, they have a very advantageous geography to the country. They're basically surrounded by mountains and it makes it almost impossible to assault the country from any direction. Wherever you want to try and invade them from, so we, you pick a country around them, you can make certain set of progress, maybe you start in Afghanistan and you can move through this mountain straight and then they've just got this incredibly defensible position in the Kabir Desert. And this is true literally from any direction you want to attack them from. Some people talk about their vulnerability in the Gulf. Um, you can land here at Bandar Abbas, but you, you, the, the distance you have to traverse to get to Tehran up here in the top left is astonishing. Iran is basically a fortress. And here we go. Cool. Uh, the, bear this in mind, by the way, next time you hear anything in the news about someone invading Iran. It's just not happening. It's just not happening. So the IRGC is not a centrally organized military in the traditional sense. It's lots of different groups and a lot of these groups operate autonomously. So I said it's huge and I said it has millions of members, but they, there isn't like one central command structure. There's branches of the IRGC in every city, in, in every military base, in every part of the country, and a lot of them don't really talk to one another and don't really, there's a lot of internal power struggles within, within this group. The main body of the IRGC is the Bazij, which is an auxiliary to law enforcement, and these function as the morality police, as I talked about previously. So you'll see people in the uniforms of the IRGC patrolling like large cities like Tehran, and basically, um, you know, picking on people for not living religiously enough or piously enough. These are the guys who will break up parties and arrest people for drinking alcohol, stuff like that. The next thing, so so when I made this presentation, this was uh, sh shortly after the assassination uh, of the guy whose name I've forgotten. This, I'll come back to it. It's on one of the next slides. So the, the Quds Force is a smaller, it's like a special forces unit that operates as a subset of the IRGC and it specializes in military intelligence and uh, unconventional warfare. So this is the, the group of Iran that collaborates with a lot of the other terrorist groups around the, maybe terrorist groups is a loaded term here. They cooperate with non-state actors. Let's use a more neutral term here. So Hezbollah in Lebanon, uh, Hamas in the Gaza Strip, the Palestinian Islamic, Islamic Jihad in the West Bank, the Houthis in Yemen, so the Yemen civil war is being driven uh, largely by a sort of non-state dissident group called the Houthis. We'll talk about them a little bit later. And they also have branches in various Shia militaries in Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan. So anywhere there's a, there's a group which is not explicitly Sunni aligned and is in opposition to either the USA or Israel or Saudi Arabia, the Quds Force will reach out to them and offer them military support, military intelligence, and just general assistance. They'll supply them with weapons, they'll supply them with training, etc. They're very, very, very effective at what they do. They have a high degree of success rate. They use lots of like next generation technologies. They use things like drone strikes. They use, uh, you know, extremely skilled group of people. Cool. Uh, so let's talk about some observations that are worth pointing out at this point. So firstly, Iran is a dictatorship, but it has lots of different powerful groups within it. So I've talked about the parliament, I've talked about the Quds Force, I've talked about the IRGC, and all of these operate autonomously. They don't necessarily always consult the central parliament or even the Supreme Leader or the Guardian Council when they carry actions out. So a lot of the time when you hear 
Iran did this. It's just because some jumped up cleric or you know, general in some part of the country sort of got a bit antsy and carried out some operation that he thought was in the interest of Iran, but perhaps wasn't. So the shooting down of the plane is probably a good example of this. Um, someone saw a plane taking off and thought, right, cool, must be a US plane. Uh, let's shoot it down. They probably didn't consult with the government at the time. The next thing is that hatred of the West is uh, deep-seated due to the historical sort of um, interfering in the region and is not something that has arisen recently. Um, next thing, Iran can't be invaded. The, the military is enormous, extremely technologically sophisticated, and the country is surrounded by natural terrain advantages through the mountains. Um, cool. I, I think the rest I've sort of already covered. So let's move on to Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia occupies the bulk of the Arabian Peninsula. When I, um, okay, I see something in the chat. Let's have a stop. Okay, uh, Nico, do you want to unmute yourself? Yep. Hey, um, I think something sort of important about Iran is like the majority of their um, macroeconomic structures are largely contingent on religious institutions. So um, appointments and distribution of resources and like loans are not made as often by banks as they are made by religious institutions with very low loans. So um, like they have enormous economic power and basically can channel corruption left and right, which creates like an enormous bureaucratic um, hemorrhage in Iran that um, stifles investment. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a lot of interesting factors as to why Iran is so economically self-sufficient. So it's one of the most independent countries in terms of uh, no, sorry, Franco, we, I, I can't hear you. I'm not sure what's happening there. Maybe I can I unmute you myself? Nope. You're unmuted, but we can't hear you. Sorry. I'm going to press on. So, um, yeah, so, so Iran is very economically self-sufficient. One, due to the sanctions. Two, due to the conditions that Nico just talked about, I mean, there hasn't been a lot of foreign investment, which means that they have to essentially produce a lot of stuff themselves. Um, and they've just historically not been particularly friendly with a lot of their allies, which meant they couldn't have cross-border trades. They had to develop a lot of stuff internally. For this reason, a lot of the economy is, is uh, heavily nationalized. So it's not that the government interferes with the economy. It's just that a lot of sectors of the economy are literally run by the government themselves or branches of the government. Anyway, let's move on to Saudi Arabia. So uh, I don't have a map, but I'll point this out. Uh, Saudi Arabia has a unique advantage over other Muslim nations in terms of its ability to wield theological influence because it, it contains both Mecca and Medina, which are the holiest, two holiest sites in Islam. So Mecca is the birthplace of Muhammad. It's the holiest city. Uh, it contains the Kaaba, which is the, this cube here on the right. And this is the point to which, so when, when Muslims do their prayers five times a day, they'll turn and face the Kaaba. Nowadays, they have an app which points out where this is. But that just should just give you some sense of like how, just how important this place is. Uh, all Muslims, as one of the five pillars of Islam, must, if they are capable at some point in their life, make the pilgrimage to Mecca, which is known as the Hajj. This is what you're seeing in this photo here, this is what the huge crowds are. And um, this is almost impossible to, over to understate just how important this is to people. This is, it, it, unless you are like financially destitute or like physically disabled in some way that would make the journey completely impossible for you, you will, if you're a Muslim, if you're a devout Muslim, it's be saving up for a large portion of your life and trying at some point really goddamn hard to try and make the pilgrimage to Mecca. What that means is then, almost regardless of where you live in the world and what your denomination of Islam is, you will want to travel to Saudi Arabia at some point. That is really worth pointing out because think how much influence that gives the country. It, some of it is hard influence, so uh, I'll talk a little bit about how, you know, if Saudi Arabia blocks flights to your country, you're, the Muslims within your country now can't make Hajj. That is a big geopolitical tool because this this is like really theologically important to people. But it's also important because while they're in Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia gets to use a lot of soft power. They get to put up propaganda posters. They get to, you know, kind of shape the message that people interact with in terms of what Islam is a lot. There tend to be, you know, conferences, lectures, um, people will attend religious sermons there, etc. So, uh, historically, they've never used this geopolitical tool of blocking people from attending Hajj. Uh, except against Iran. So there's been a couple of instances in the last couple of decades, especially where when relations have really broken down, Saudi Arabia has blocked flights to Iran. And that, as you might imagine, is pretty, pretty effective in getting what they want. So uh, history of Saudi Arabia. The Saudi refers to the historical Saudi royal family established in 1744, which is when uh, these two groups um, led by the, uh, Mohammed bin Saud, i.e. Saud is in Saudi, 
and Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab. So Wahhab here refers, maybe you've heard of Wahhabism, which is a really extreme puritanical form of Sunni Islam, um, which still wields a lot of influence in modern Saudi Arabia. So they, the, these groups essentially established the Saudi state in the area around Riyadh, which is one of the largest cities in Saudi Arabia, and they largely spread out and ended up controlling much of the uh, Arabian Peninsula up until the Ottoman expansion. In 1916, so the, with the support of the British, uh, this guy Hussein bin Ali led a revolt which successfully ejected the Ottomans and established uh, the modern state of Saudi Arabia. And cool. All right, I don't have a full map, but the, the Arabian Peninsula, if you look at a map and you look at where Saudi Arabia is, you'll see that the Arabian Peninsula is basically just Saudi Arabia and a bunch of smaller states. Yemen exists to the south, I'll point this out on the map. So Saudi Arabia occupied a large portion of land, but a lot of this land is desert. Very little of it was suitable for farming, and there was almost no natural resources, little water, not even any mining or anything that could be done previously. So this was a very, very poor part of the world. And while it was important for geopolitical reasons as, do I have a map here somewhere? Here we go, cool. So if you look at this map, if you look at what Saudi, where Saudi Arabia is, you can see that they control both uh, shipping through the Red Sea uh, and uh, through the um, uh, Persian Gulf, which is the one, the, the one on the right. So it's an incredibly important position to be occupying just on a pure geopolitical terms, um, but historically it wasn't particularly economically important. So let's, let's head back here to the modern era. So then they discover oil and this changes the entire game. And so this map here on the right shows you where the oil and gas sectors within the region are. So in 1941, uh, via the US controlled Aramco, this was used to supply um, the allies with oil and basically kept the allied war machine running. Uh, so World War II is marked by the incredible importance of mechanized infantry, things like tanks, also air forces. Um, all of this meant that if you wanted to survive in World War II, you needed oil. And that immediately catapults Saudi Arabia into a position of utmost importance. Then during the war, but also afterwards, the oil revenues make them extremely rich. Now, the USA is already invested in the region, but now they understand that economically, this is the, the person to go to. So this is a lot of people sort of question, you know, why does, why did, um, why did the USA and sort of the West, which were relatively liberal, why did they align themselves with the much more conservative, sort of less democratic uh, Saudi state rather than the Iranians who were more sort of natural ideological allies for them? And this is the reason. They, the, the oil that they controlled in this region was in, like, just it's absolutely essential for keeping the West running during World War II. And this followed through afterwards, especially when, you know, people were not sure if another European war would break out. The odds were pretty good that one would. And so if, another, if World War III starts again in Europe, you want to be on the outside of the Saudis if you want to win. And then, of course, once they start um, this, then uh, they kind of have to keep the alliance going due to the having picked a side in the Sunni Shia split that I discussed previously. So uh, everyone knows Saudi Arabia produces a lot of oil, but I think a lot of people don't have an understanding of just the sheer power that Saudi Arabia has in terms of controlling the global oil supply. So they're the second largest producer of oil. And very recently, the USA overtook them. But it's important to understand that the USA is not a massive oil exporter. So a lot of the oil that the USA produces is consumed domestically. Whereas Saudi Arabia, relative to the amount of oil that they produce, you use very little. So they are the largest producer of oil, second largest producer of oil, but they are probably the largest exporter. Now, oil is unique uh, relative to a lot of other goods due to something called arbitrage. So that means Oil is oil. It doesn't matter where it came from. It doesn't matter you know, who's had it before. All that matters is you can put it in your car or your factory and burn it. So what that means is that no one's gonna prioritize Saudi oil or USA oil or Russian oil. They don't care. All oil is oil as far as the global markets are concerned. Once it's been processed, of course. Um, actually, that is important. So I'll come back to that in a second. We're talking about processed oil here. So that means whoever selling oil at the cheapest price controls the price level of almost all the oil. So if Saudi Arabia drops their prices for oil, everyone else kind of has to follow them. Uh, otherwise, people would just buy Saudi oil. Now, Saudi Arabia, therefore, is unique in two regards. The first one I've talked about, which is that they produce so much oil. But the second one is that they have the lowest production costs by far of any country. So Venezuela, for example, has enormous oil, has the largest oil reserves in the world. Saudi Arabia is only the second. So in terms of the, sh the sheer quantity of oil in their land that they could theoretically access, Saudi Arabia has uh, the most, uh, it says second most, sorry, Venezuela has the most. The difference between these two countries and why Venezuela is not nearly as important for global oil markets is that Venezuelan oil is incredibly contaminated with sulfur. So if Venezuela wants to sell its oil, it has to engage in substantially more processing. They have to engage in much more like 
complicated technological processes to filter their oil and to make it burnable. Saudi Arabia, by comparison, basically just needs to stick a, a pipe in the ground and oil will come out that is almost already ready to be burnt. They just need to separate it out into different fractions. So Saudi Arabia can sell oil at like $20 a barrel and still be making a profit. Venezuelan oil requires something like $80 a barrel to make a profit. Um, no other country comes close to having the, the purity and the cheapness of oil production that Saudi Arabia has. Some of the other Gulf states like um, Bahrain and, and Qatar are, are on sort of a similar level, but their reserves are tiny compared to Saudi Arabia. Russia, again, is has a lot of oil and they sell a lot of oil, but it's incredibly expensive for them to produce it. Canada is the same. They have a ton of oil, but it's incredibly expensive. So Russia can't really engage in like games of the oil prices on the global stage. If Russia wants to drop the price of the oil they sell, they're just eating a loss now. They're just basically giving oil away. Saudi Arabia, meanwhile, can drop oil almost as far as they, like down to $20 a barrel. That is really important because as you may have seen in the recent news, um, when the price of oil tanks, a lot of countries become crippled, Russia, Venezuela, even Canada. Now, uh, Saudi Arabia is also the acts as the de facto head of OPEC because of this. And this is a coalition that controls 81.5% of the global oil supply. So if Saudi Arabia comes to an OPEC meeting and says, we're going to keep producing oil and we're going to sell it cheaper than you, like you are essentially going to do what they say. And this has been the state of affairs for about 50 years now. Not 50 years? 40 years since the 1970s oil crash. Cool. So uh, politics of Saudi Arabia. They have a... Uh, that, so the House of Saud is still the rulers of the country, although it's an enormous entity. So not all of them members of the House of Saud uh, actually build political powers. They have 7,000 members, uh, but almost all people in positions of power within the government and the economy and uh, the, the religious institutions largely stem from the House of Saud. Now, they are one family, but that is a really misleading term here because there is enormous internal divisions within them. So there are different clans, there are different branches of the family. Um, there's different religious groups. So you have the Wahhabists, uh, who I talked earlier about, who are like really extreme, and you have the moderates, um, people like uh, MBS, who sort of want to drive the country in a more uh, liberal, economically open direction. Uh, the current king, Salman bin Abdulaziz Al Saud, is quite old, um, not in great health. He doesn't, he is the de facto ruler, autocrat, if you will, of the state, but he doesn't actually exercise that much power. Uh, he has largely sort of taken a backseat. Uh, his son, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, is the, uh, like, I don't know why I put DPM there. He's the, the it's successor to the crown prince. Um, sorry, he's the crown prince, which means he will inherit uh, the becoming king of the country. Uh, but he basically runs it right now. Now, he has somewhat begun liberalizing the country, um, but it's not clear exactly what his intentions are here. He's also engaged in crackdowns on corruption. So he arrested many members of uh, the House of Saud who had been basically embezzling state funds and then released them later once they you know, apologize, release the funds, etc. This was seen as largely him sort of staking his claim on power. So he sort of comes in, arrests a bunch of people just to show that he basically can. And now essentially no one questions his leadership. He's essentially seen as running the country. Um, he's also overseen the campaign in Yemen. And he's also, again, this is why I say it's confusing to cast him as purely a libera liberalizing figure, because he's also engaged in a lot of like diplomatic feuds with other countries, um, prominently Canada, but you might have also heard of the embargo on Qatar. He's also um, sort of gone to war a little bit with Lebanon and Turkey, not literally gone to war, but like engaged in aggressive actions against these governments. So he's, he's really like taking Saudi Arabia into the tw uh, 21st century um, in terms of expanding the amount of power that they've otherwise sort of been taking a backseat from for a little while. He's really trying to make them an important player in the Middle East and on the global stage. The military of Saudi Arabia is fascinating because it's almost the complete opposite of Iran. So whereas Iran, I said, is extremely sophisticated, well-trained, not massively funded. So it's important to note now, Iran per capita is a lot poorer than Saudi Arabia. Something like one, one tenth or like somewhere between one tenth and one fifth as, as rich. Like Iran is a relatively poor country. Saudi Arabia is one of the richest countries in the world. So Iran gets away with spending very little on the military because as I said, they have a huge volunteer force. They do, do produce their own military equipment. Comparatively, Saudi Arabia has one of the highest percentages of military expenditure in the world. I think it might actually be number one. So as a percentage of GDP, they spend, I think, they're either like number one, two, or three in, in the world. It's absurd how much money they spend on their military. Despite this, its military is relatively small. It's poorly disciplined. It's largely ineffective. They don't have a massive amount of training. They don't have, like, 
nearly the sort of battle readiness that Iran does. So whereas Iran has actually fought a bunch of wars in recent years and come out, you know, largely on top, um, uh, Saudi Arabia has never really properly been battle tested. Most of its military equipment comes from the USA, from France, and from Britain, and it's essentially reliant on supplies and training from these countries. So even though they have a lot of equipment, it's important to understand military equipment is not something you buy, stick on a shelf and you know you keep it there until the future. Like you need people to be continuously training with planes, with you know anti-aircraft um, batteries, with various equipment that they're using, a lot of the high-tech sort of surveillance equipment and stuff requires a lot of training to operate. And also like the, the quantities of munitions that they have are not indefinite. So that even if they have a bunch of F-16s or whatever from the USA, if they want to keep refueling those, getting spare parts when things break, even just getting missiles, um, that means they're constantly reliant on support from these other nations. So it's a bit of a two-way street, right? The next thing I want to point out is Saudi Arabia is the world's largest funder of foreign terrorism, but this is a bit misleading. And, and I've, from what I've read, I think this is not clear cut and, and people have pushed back on me when I said this before. So take this with a pinch of salt, but it, the evidence doesn't really point to senior members of the military or the royal family themselves funding foreign terrorism. It seems to be more that people who are sort of high up within the Saudi royal family have independently from the Saudi state been supporting foreign terrorism. Um, we also see other things like, for example, uh, they get a lot of Wahhabist clerics in Europe get funding from Saudi Arabia, but this is not believed to come directly from the Saudi government per se, in the sense that they're also not Wahhabists and they're not particularly fond of Wahhabism because it is so extreme. So sometimes when you hear Saudi Arabia funded X, like that doesn't mean the Saudi Arabian government did, that just means a rich individual high up in the Saudi royal family did. They do have, however, appear to turn a blind eye to this, or at least don't put enough effort into investigating it and rooting it out. So, because a lot of the consequences of it do benefit them. It, the more extreme sort of interpretations of Sunni Islam that exist around the rest of the world, the more closely those countries now are sort of tied to Saudi Arabia. So it's unclear exactly what their role is in this. And I don't think anyone outside of the core power structures of the Saudi family really knows what's going on. Right, so as probably everyone knows, they have an atrocious human rights record. They, for the reasons I just outlined, but also others, they are pretty destabilizing influence. Uh, they don't really care about international law. They're happy to like violate it when it's in their interest. They, you know, when I made this lecture, they'd relatively recently uh, hacked a journalist to death in, in the Saudi embassy in Turkey. So why is everyone supporting them? Well, hopefully this is implicit from some of the stuff I've outlined previously, but it's worth summarizing. So it's three reasons. One, it's the religious significance. Saudi Arabia, almost because they are ideologically, sorry, like theologically aligned with almost 90% of the world's global Muslim population, and they contain those holy sites, and they have such like senior clerics within Sunni Islam, they get to basically dictate what Islam is to a large portion of the world. Or at least if they don't dictate it, they have a lot of influence over what the people's perceptions of what Islam is, what is the correct way to be a Muslim, and what in terms of like global trends is appropriate. The next thing is, as I said, that they control their global, they can basically single-handedly can turn the lever on global oil prices. If Saudi Arabia wants oil prices to go up, either by cutting their own supply or through OPEC, they can dictate that. Similarly, if they want the oil price to crash, usually to hurt Iran, they can do that. You need Saudi Arabia on your side if you want to control global oil prices or even have a say in that. Um, lastly, it's their geographical position. So again, if you're looking at this, if you look at this map, if you want to engage in shipping through the Suez Canal, moving down here through the Red Sea and into the Arabian Sea, which is like essential if you want, you, know, you look at the map in the top right, if you want to access Asia from, from Europe or even from a lot of North America, it's in your interest to go through this channel. And that means if Saudi Arabia chooses to, they could essentially set up a powerful navy here and blockade almost anyone they wanted to from shipping and exchange with Asia. The other one is the Persian Gulf. This is where a lot of the oil is and also equally, if a country's want to ship their oil through the Persian Gulf, Saudi Arabia has a lot of, you know, has the capacity to block anyone from doing so. Cool. So, powerful ally, almost indispensable. Next time you hear someone say, oh, you know, we should just boycott Saudi Arabia, or, you know, we should, why are we continuing to support them? This is why. If you want to have any say on the, on, in the world, Saudi Arabia is one of the most important chess pieces. Right, let's, uh, let's get some observations going. Firstly, as I pointed out, saying Saudi Arabia did X is useless statement. Who did it? Was it which member of the royal family did it? Which, like, uh, which uh, ideological group in the royal family did it uh, is probably more important than just saying a generic Saudi Arabia did X. 
the Saudi Arabian military, while extremely well equipped and like very high tech, and you know, it's you know, got a decent. There's a decent number of people in that military. It's pretty weak. Um, in an outright war between Saudi Arabia and Iran, despite the incredible asymmetry and the amount of funding they have and the, the sophistication of the technology accessible to them both, probably Iran would win. Um, that said, of course, you have to remember that Saudi Arabia has a lot more allies in the region because apart from the, the ones that I identified, uh, i.e. like Lebanon, uh, Syria, and uh, Iraq, they, there's very few other countries in the Middle East or in North Africa that are Shia Muslim. They're almost all Sunni Muslim, and therefore they almost all back Saudi Arabia. So the West relies on Saudi Arabia to maintain its influence over the region because, going back to the start of this lecture, because so many of these countries like despise the West for the historical reasons, but are reasonably amenable to Saudi Arabia, it's easier to, you know, liaise with the Saudi leaders and have them carry out the goals that you want in the region on your behalf. They wield disproportionate influence over the global Muslim community due to Hajj, and as I said, with OPEC, they have a lot of power to control global oil prices. All right. So that summarizes basically, I think, the key stuff that uh, comes out on in the, that you need to know about Iran and Saudi Arabia. And um, next, we're going to sort of talk about some specific geopolitical issues, and then hopefully that will sort of put a lot of this theory that I've kind of dealt with into practice. So I have a question from Ala that says, um, why is the military so weak despite all the financing? It's a really good question. So I think there's kind of a presumption from people who have never uh, directly in, like been inside military structures or talk to people inside military structures, there's a lot of confusion on how militaries operate. So the main thing is a military is not something you can just create overnight. So let's say you fired all of the military in your country, you just completely disbanded the military. And then just as a thought experiment, someone's like in one year's time, you're going to be at war. You can't just like create a military out of thin air in the space of a year because you need experienced officers to t train the people younger. You need people who've had experience using this equipment for a long time to teach the people who come into the military now. You can't just recruit people out of thin air and have them occupy senior positions like generals or officers or military strategists unless they already know how to do that stuff. The problem Saudi Arabia had, uh, has and probably will have going into the future is that they've never really fought a serious war with anyone. So whereas Iran uh, fought the war with Iraq and has historically um, you know, participated in like World War uh, two and so on, and also the, through the Quds Force, they, they engage in a lot of military conflicts through proxy groups. Saudi Arabia doesn't have this. There's very little military expertise within Saudi Arabia. The next thing to understand is that the, the Saudi Arabia, I don't know how to put this in sensitive terms, but it's, uh, it's essentially like there's a lot of well-paid people without much expertise. There's a lot of corruption within the state, and a lot of people who occupy senior positions within the Saudi military weren't promoted there due to military competence because there's no way to test military competence when you've never been at war. And critically, given that the people higher up who might otherwise have promoted people for perceived military competence don't exist. Instead, a lot of the key positions within the military are simply occupied by people who are either in the royal family or friends or loyal to the royal family. Um, the other thing is because they have never, like they're in a pretty comfortable geopolitical position, these trends are unlikely to change. Um, yeah, as uh, yeah, as Nico points out, right, that this is probably compounded by the, the fact that they're paid so highly. So people are drawn into the military for the high pay, not necessarily because they're like passionate, diehard defenders. Uh, so that uh, honestly, you could give a whole lecture on the dysfunctions in the Saudi military, I think. But I think that's probably enough for at least debating terms. Um, but you can go away and read about it. It's um, it's a fascinating case study in why throwing money at problems doesn't solve them. Um, okay. Rentier statism. I'm not sh exactly sure what you mean by that, Franco. And given that you can't unmute yourself, I'm not really sure what to do. So um, I'm really going to have to blow past that. If you can explain the question in, yeah, if you type out what you mean, and I'll talk about it. All right. So we have another question from Samuel. Uh, how much are Iran's military capacity, especially the Quds force, i.e. Like the funding of non-state actors in the region, seriously constrained by their current economic woes? That's a really good question. They have been hampered. It's uh, the Iran's ability to power pro project power in the region has definitely decreased due to the current economic so okay for those of you who don't know iran's in a bit of an uh, economic crisis at the moment for two reasons one is that they're under embargo by the west so basically the sanctions um that were lifted under obama's joint um action plan on nuclearization they were lifted temporarily trump's basically put them all back this means iran is back in a position of not being able to engage in foreign trade with most of the world 
apart from Russia. So as a consequence, Iran is basically under military embargo, uh, sorry, um, economic embargo, and their economy is kind of on the brink. There's been a lot of protests, especially within Tehran, because people are starving and just generally very poor, and it's gotten worse. That said, due to the structure of the military and the way it's like kind of decentralized, a lot of these sectors of the military haven't really lost funding. So while the population is poorer, the military is largely getting the same amount of money. That said, the government's definitely pulled back on their ambitions within the region. We've seen a lot less activism, for example, with Hezbollah, um, also a lot less uh, provision of arms to uh, the Palestinian areas, particularly the Gaza Strip. Uh, largely, this points to a trend within Iran in which the, the perception seems to be that they're scaling back their geopolitical ambitions and trying to focus more on, on sort of stabilizing the country internally at the moment. Um, the truth is no one fully knows. There's definitely been a downward trend in their activity, but partly that seems to be because they've moved a lot of their focus into controlling um, the Iraqi government to a greater extent. So I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. All right, what are these other questions? Will you talk about the oil trade routes, recent Iranian attacks on the Saudis? Yep, a little bit towards the end. Um, but what I do want to get across is this lecture is only going to be an hour and a half tops. And uh, I can't talk about every single geopolitical actor. Uh, sorry, every geopolitical event that's occurred. Okay, uh, I'm going to move on. The oil dependency question of Saudi Arabia. The Frank, can you mute? Sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm going to press on. We'll do some Q&A at the end, I think. All right, Yemen. Can you, Ron, can you hear me now? I can, yeah. What's hey. up? Hi. Did you do run to your status already? I'm not 100% sure what you mean by that. So, um, a, a, an important economical aspect of, say, authoritarianism in Saudi Arabia is the fact that there's no legitimacy from the population because taxation essentially does not exist. Oh, yeah. So I talked about this in the authoritarianism lecture a lot, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it here. Um, it's not really relevant to the geopolitics. Uh, it is incredibly important for understanding Saudi Arabia. I talked about it a lot in um, the authoritarianism lecture, so I'm not going to repeat myself. I mean, it's quite important for understanding how Egypt, for example, is dependent on Saudi Arabia and the Gulf, or how the Gulf has interest in Palestine, or why the Palestine can't move without the Gulf's approval, for example. Oh, sorry. I thought you were talking about within the Saudi state. Let, let's um let's push this to the end because I want to make sure okay. I get the material I've got, uh, and um, this seems slightly separate to. So let, let's move on to talking about Yemen. So the first thing is if you look at this map, uh, remember how I said that Saudi Arabia had a lot of control over um, shipping and stuff through the Red Sea. Well, that relies on the cooperation of Yemen because Yemen control. Um, oh God, I'm having a mind blank. Franco, what's the, the, the little gap there that, that bridges the Gulf of Aden? Anyone know? Yeah, this, has a, this has a name that's escaped me right now. Anyway, um, the point is Yemen is kind of a blockade on Saudi Arabia's ability to project power within the region. I.e. if the Yemeni's government is not uh, aligned with Saudi Arabia, a lot of that power goes out the window. So what's going on in Yemen? You may have heard that there's been a war going on there for quite a while. So what happened is Yemen historically was very closely aligned uh, with Saudi Arabia. It's a majority Sunni country. And that said, though, in the Northwest, I believe, there is a political movement called the Houthis, who are Shia. Uh, and their movement um, has essentially emerged in opposition to the Yemeni government. And they launched a, a violent insurgency a couple of years ago uh, against the Yemeni's government, trying to essentially establish a separate state there. Uh, in 2015, the Yemeni government was unable to constrain them anymore, so they asked for support from regional allies. No, this wasn't exclusively Saudi Arabia, but given that no one else in the region has the ability to project power, so what I mean by that is, you know, uh, some of these other countries, Oman, for example, Egypt, do have militaries, but those militaries can't be deployed abroad. So the Egyptian military is quite effective within Egypt. They're not very effective once they have to leave Egypt. They don't have an air force, they don't have aircraft, they do have an air force, sorry, but they don't have aircraft carriers, for example. Um, whereas Saudi Arabia, however, is literally on the board with Yemen and has a relatively sophisticated air force. So they, they can launch um, bombing strikes within Yemen. This is largely how they've supported the Yemeni's government through the use of airstrikes. On the flip side, and this is again why you need to understand both Iran and Saudi Arabia and how they function within the Middle East. Iran supports the Houthis. So they've been funneling them uh, financial and military support. And it's believed that basically all of the um, 
you know, the guns that are being used by the Houthi insurgents against the Yemeni's government are coming from Iran. Um, cool. So this is a map of Yemen, and the uh, the green sectors are the sectors controlled by the Houthis, and the uh, wait, do I have that right? Yeah, I do. Um, and the uh, red sectors are the ones controlled by. It's been so long since I made this, I've forgotten which one's which. I'm reasonably sure because it's the northwest, that's the Houthi controlled sector. All right. So. Um, Lots of countries have, uh, you know, participated in the intervention, but usually it's been in this form of either supplying munitions or, you know, economic assistance to the Yemeni's government. Saudi Arabia has been the big player in terms of military intervention. So the Saudi Air Force has launched literally thousands of bombing strikes within the region um, in, against Houthi positions. This has caused probably the largest humanitarian crisis that is the result of conflict, I think, probably anywhere on the planet, except for maybe Syria. So. Um, like th the the thousands there is an understatement i think i can't remember the exact figures but it's in the tens of thousands of yemeni civilians that have been killed um but the more immediate consequences that a lot of these bombing runs have largely disrupted civilian infrastructure things like water supplies things like food um like you know the ability to transport food throughout the country so even if the actual uh toll of the number of people that have died is relatively small compared to a conflict like in um syria the disruption has been immense and millions and millions of people have been internally displaced within Yemen. And the, again, for the same reasons as Saudi Arabia, this is not a particularly fertile area. This means that they have been largely dependent on foreign trade for supplies of food and such, which has been disrupted by the conflict. And that means there is essentially a mass famine ongoing in Yemen. Uh, and and it's, it's like, it's not really getting any better. Now, this is uh, essentially, so, so the USA has tried to help by in intervening in the flow of Iranian weapons into Yemen, but um, there's already a lot of guns already on the ground. And also, it, it looks easy on a map to just blockade shipping, but there's so many ships moving around this area due to the Suez Canal, due to the oil trade, etc., that it's almost impossible to identify which ones are the Iranian ships being used to smuggle in weapons into Yemen. And as a result, uh, the country is like the civil war is still going and, and I haven't read about it in the last couple of weeks, but by all accounts, this doesn't look like it's slowing down. Um, now, this comes back to what I talked about, the Saudi Arabian military and their relative dysfunction, because part of the problem has been that the Saudi Arabian military, it's incredibly difficult to intervene in a conflict that's ongoing in civilian areas. So conflicts nowadays don't look like, you know, two, two armies lining up on the other, either side of the battlefield and charging each other. The Houthis will operate within villages, within towns. Their military bases will be within parliament, uh, parliament apartment blocks. They're, 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 there's very little separation between what are Houthi fighters and what are civilian areas controlled by Houthis. Um, the result of this is Saudi Arabia doesn't have fantastic intelligence. The USA has largely scaled back the degree of deployment within the region, so they also don't have fantastic intelligence um, in the area which means that the Saudi Arabian military, while it has the technological capacity to launch airstrikes, it's not able to do it in a very, I want to say, intelligent way. So they've, they essentially started the campaign by saying, right, we'll just bomb the shit out of every area that's remotely affiliated with the Houthis, and this will drive them into submission. Which, if you have any military expertise, you would have, you, you know, it would have been made clear that this is a terrible idea, because the initial wave of bombings drove massive increase in support for the Houthis, at the point at which the Yemeni's government was seen to have invited a foreign invading force, which just massacred civilians. And so this basically blew up the conflict to much greater proportions than it had been before, at the point at which now the Houthis, whereas previously a lot of people in Yemen didn't necessarily care, now they had a lot of support. And this is why Saudi Arabia's ineptitude is relevant, because this is the first time they've tried to engage in a serious intervention, and they have really screwed it up. Um, now, to pose the flip side to this, you might say, okay, well, given the complexities of civilian in, uh, military interventions, you know, maybe other countries would have been just as bad. Um, that's plausible, but unclear. Um, certainly, this has been one of the worst-led uh, military interventions, like, in recent history. Okay, so let's switch tactics now. Let's uh, talk about, so Nico asked about the uh, Iran's um, actions against Saudi Arabian oil supply. So um, the intuition here is, given the importance of Saudi Arabian oil in terms of their geopolitical power, it's fairly logical that this would be one of the uh, immediate sort of pressure points for Iran in terms of retaliating or trying to disrupt Saudi Arabia's power on the global stage. And this is true. So in late 2019, like a week before I made this lecture, uh, the uh, Aramco oil refining facilities in um, two places, Abkhaz and Karay, 
uh, were essentially attacked and no one exactly knew who did it, but uh, the attack was believed to be carried out by drones. So they had essentially a, a small fleet of drones armed with individually small explosives, which they targeted at critical infrastructure within uh, these oil production facilities and within the oil fields. The use of the sort of, uh, how do I put it? The, the, the technology they were using and the sophistication of the attack is very trademark of the Quds Force. So um, Qasem Soleimani, this is it. This is the guy's name I forgot earlier. The, the guy was assassinated by uh, the USA. Um, so given that this was that this was occurring in oil fields that were proximal to Iran, a lot of Iranian shipping had been, a lot of Iranian um, IRGC ships had been floating around uh, in the uh, Persian Gulf. This was believed, and you know, they'd been doing things like stopping oil tankers and sort of not literally trading blows, but sort of antagonizing Saudi, British and USA ships in the region that were used for shipping. Um, this was believed to basically be a cover for like, an intelligence operation in which they were identifying and surveilling the region in order to find weak points in the Saudi Arabian oil supply. And then they launched a drone attack, which knocked out something like 50% of um, the, sorry, 50% of Saudi oil supply, which made up something like 5% of the global oil supply. Now, the Houthis claimed responsibility, um, but no one really believes that, given that, like, look at the map, look where Yemen is. They also don't have nearly the technological equipment to do this. Um, basically, the conclusion is the Quds Force did this, and this was headed by Qasem Soleimani. So the belief is, take this with a pinch of salt, but probably the assassination of Qasem Soleimani was done by the USA at the behest of Saudi Arabia in retaliation um, for this. Uh, so, sorry, the, the, I have that the wrong way around, sorry. This was retaliation for the assassination of Qasem Soleimani. Um, but it was very likely that this was something he'd been planning, um, given that this was his specialty in asymmetric warfare. Cool. Um, all right, that kind of talks about two um, sort of feuds between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Now let's uh, talk about nuclearization, because this is another thing that both comes up in debates and is of immense importance. Presently, there's only believed to be one nuclear arm. Uh, hang on, I have a question. Let's see if that's. Yeah, so Soleimani was hugely popular in Iran to the point where the council feared him. Um, the, the internal dynamics there are not super clear cut, but yeah, broadly speaking, he was one of the most powerful figures because he occupied a, he was the head of the Quds Force. And I, like I said earlier, they, these guys are largely autonomous and don't necessarily directly answer to the government. So their actions, while they're having a, uh, repercussions for Iran, were not in direct control of the Guardian Council. Um, the degree to which he was popular or unpopular within Iran, source of contention. Um, I'm not sure there's a clear cut answer there. So ongoing nuclearization. There's only one known nuclear armed state within the Middle East, and that's Israel. Although they publicly deny any such program. <laughs> Although, Hilariously, I think on the day I gave this, the Israeli foreign minister in an interview made a slip up and like said something about their nuclear program before correcting himself. And um, this was, as far as I'm aware, the first time uh, Israel had ever admitted public or any Israeli official had publicly admitted that they had a nuclear program. Um, that said, uh, Iran has been trying to get one for a very long time. So they launched their program in the 1950s. And actually this was with the help of the USA at the time, um, but it was for nuclear power. Uh, the USA rapidly discontinued this uh, following the 1979 revolution. Um, and as a result, this has been an illegal nuclear program ever since. So in 2003, the state of progress within this was relatively unclear. So it's important to understand that while now Iran is very technologically advanced, in the 1950s, they really weren't. Uh, and in the 19, in 1979, they also were not a sort of world technological power. So it was unclear for a long time how far along the road towards a nuclear weapon they were. Until 2003, uh, when the uh, international agency that deals with you know, surveilling nuclear programs around the world, uh, they revealed their investigation that concluded that Iran was engaging in uh, nuclear enrichment. So if you don't know what that means, essentially, uranium on its own is not particularly useful for a nuclear weapon. You have to separate out different isotopes of uranium um, to get the ones that can be converted into uh, plutonium, which is what you use for nuclear weapons. Uh, as it was, uh, Iran, people knew that Iran had uranium and nuclear materials, but in of itself, that might just be for nuclear energy. This investigation concluded that they were trying deliberately to separate out isotopes of uranium that would be used specifically for a nuclear weapon and couldn't be justified under any other criteria. 
So this sounded the alarm and a response was a sort of global wave of sanctions that haven't really fully been lifted since. They also haven't been massively effective. Uh, Iran's nuclear program has continued. And in 2015, they were believed to be about a year away from uh, possessing a functional nuclear missile. So no, producing the technology to deploy a nuclear weapon in of itself is not, that, that's not the end of the story. The other part is you need to have what's called an ICBM, an intercontinental ballistic missile. So if Iran creates a nuclear warhead, that is really scary for Israel, but it's not terribly threatening for the USA because they have to be able to deploy it in such a way as that it can strike thousands of kilometers away. Uh, as it was, therefore, um, Iran's program was quite far advanced on, on, on terms of nuclear enrichment, but their, their missile technology was still lagging behind. So in 2015, faced with no other options, again, remember what I pointed out earlier, Iran is a fortress, it's completely uninvadable. Um, it was never, so Republicans at the time in 2015 were sort of harassing Obama, saying, you know, we should need to intervene. And to some extent, this is kind of still ongoing. It's just not realistic. And so Obama was left with essentially no choice but to engage in diplomacy with them, which was like fairly successful given the kind of nature of the state act that you're dealing with. This was seen as a, as a diplomatic breakthrough. So the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action uh, curtailed Iran's ability to enrich uranium. So they had to dismantle uh, the separation facilities for the isotopes. And it had far-reaching international oversight. So this meant agents from the UN, from the IEA, uh, no, IAEA, uh, so the International Agency on Nuclear, I've forgotten what it stands for. Um, basically, they could go in without warning and inspect any of Iran's scientific and nuclear energy facilities. So the idea was not only would they break down the current progress on nuclear weapons, but they would be heavily surveilled by global agencies in terms of um, whether they were you know, breaking the, sanction, uh, the, the restrictions. The other thing it agreed is that they would cease all um, ballistic missile testing. So as I said, the important thing is not necessarily whether or not, it's not just whether you have a nuclear warhead, it's also whether you have the missile technology. Now, this is, as far as I can tell, the closest to the truth of what's happened. They did appear to be following the enrichment protocol. So they, they, they had genuinely ceased the enrichment of uranium. So in that sense, they were complying with the deal in terms of they were no longer accelerating towards the path of producing a nuclear warhead, but they were already quite far down that road. So the concern was, even if they weren't currently enriching nuclear, uh, nuclear materials, at any point they could restart their program and be six months away from having enough enriched uranium to produce an active warhead. The difficulty was that Iran was in genuine breach of the ballistic missile test criteria. So they were still testing missile technology in ways that were believed to either contravene or directly break the um, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. This was in 2018 and 2017 particularly, so this is while Trump is in office now. So uh, under, believed under pressure from Israel, but also in the sense that this was sort of pissing off a lot of people globally, uh, Saudi Arabia as well as relevant here, Trump withdrew from the, the deal and uh, the, the EU has tried to maintain it. So what the deal essentially agreed is that in return for ceasing their um, progress towards a nuclear weapon, Iran would be opened up economically. So they were given a lot of money back that had been frozen in international payments. Um, countries were allowed to trade with them again. This was all suspended following the withdrawal from the deal, which has put Iran in a lot of economic pressure. Uh, the, as I said, the EU tried to revive the deal, but without the US's support, it was basically dead. So Iran has now returned to enriching uranium. Uh, I haven't kept up with this as closely, but I would imagine at this point, they're sort of months away from an active nuclear warhead. Or maybe they've already got one. I'm, I would need to go away and research this. Now, this is hugely threatening for a couple of reasons. The first one is, point. Uh, remember what I said earlier about the structure of the Iranian military and how it's a decentralized organization made up of lots of autonomous groups? It's not clear who would control a nuclear warhead in Iran if or even if one group would. So maybe we trust, you know, the Guardian Council and we trust the Iranian military to responsibly hold on to nuclear technology, but it's not clear if we trust the Quds force to do that. So that's one of the threats when they were on. Like the, the 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 biggest fear in Israel, for example, is that the Quds force loses some small quantity of nuclear material, which ends up in the hands of the hands of Hezbollah, who then launch a dirty bomb in Tel Aviv or in Jerusalem. Okay, probably not in Jerusalem, but maybe in Tel Aviv, right? Um, 
this is admittedly paranoid and, and you know, not immediately clear that this happened, but the consequences of something like that happening would be so devastating uh, that Iran is probably the biggest threat to Israel's ongoing existence. The other big concern is that the, the, the buck doesn't stop with Iran. If Iran gets a nuclear weapon, the biggest concern is that Saudi Arabia has essentially had an agreement with the USA that states, so long as you know, Iran doesn't have a nuclear weapon, we'll concede that we don't need one either. If Iran gets one, the USA will essentially have failed in its obligations in that respect. And as a consequence, Saudi Arabia will probably press on with its own nuclear program, given that the USA has essentially shown that it's incapable of stopping or protecting it from Iran's nuclear ambitions. Furthermore, Saudi Arabia could probably get a nuclear, active nuclear warhead a lot quicker than Iran has been able to, because Pakistan is a nuclear armed nation which is allied with Saudi Arabia very closely, and therefore Pakistan could essentially sell ready-to-go nuclear technology to uh, Saudi Arabia in a very short period of time. So nuclearization of the Middle East is a, a, a Pandora's box. Once, once it starts, it'll probably be impossible to reverse. At that point, you would have a variety of different governments, most of whom are not very stable, um, or very reliable, I should say, who would all have access to nuclear materials. Um, this, this would be a pretty st scary state of affairs, and actually probably one that we're realistically going to see in our lifetime. All right, proxy wars. This is the, the last thing I wanted to talk about. Um, so let me see how many, how many more slides. Okay, so this is the last slide. Nice. Um, so most, in debates especially, most proxy wars that occur in the Middle East can be boiled down to Iran and Russia versus the Saudi, Saudi Arabia and the USA. So uh, Syria, for example, has a Shiite government. Uh, Iran has been backing Syria, so has Russia. Saudi Arabia has been funding Sunni rebels within Syria to try and destabilize influence within the region. Um, Iran funds Hamas and Hezbollah. Hezbollah is a Shia organization. Hamas is not. But as I say, they don't really care. They'll fund anyone who's destabilizing Israel and harming the USA. Uh, Iraq has uh, historically, during the Ba'athist days, i.e. the reign of Saddam Hussein, uh, they were a Sunni government, despite the country being majority Shia. Since the US invasion and the civil war, Iran has been backing Shia factions and now wields substantial influence over the Iraqi government. This has been a very rapidly moving state of affairs, so the information here is probably, well, I haven't put any in because I knew it was going to change so rapidly, but if you go away and read it, there's a real power struggle going on right now in Iraq, especially within the government, but also at various lower levels of government as to whether or not Iraq is going to come out of the current state of affairs being uh, an Iranian puppet state or a Saudi Arabian puppet state. That's really their only options. They're not, not going to be an independent power in the near future, they're going to have to pick one of these two sides. Um, last time I was looking, it seemed like Iran was making the most headway there. Uh, Saudi Arabia has also um, been strengthening ties with the Kurdistan regional government um, in the sense that they would be a useful ally in blocking Iranian expansion in uh, Syria and in surrounding regions. So um, in debates, basically, if it's about the Middle East, probably Saudi Arabia and Iran are relevant actors and probably analyzing their incentives within the region and how it makes one of them stronger or makes the other one less strong is your best bet. So that's the why this lecture focuses on them so specifically and hopefully throughout it's become apparent you know why I focused on them at the expense of almost all other nations. Right uh, lastly I have some sources for you to read so CFR Council for Foreign Relations probably the best free source for geopolitics news like anywhere. If you listen to they have a podcast it's on Spotify called The World Next Week uh, it comes out once a week, unsurprisingly, and it talks about trends in geopolitics and things that are likely to happen within the next week, as well as the historical context of those. If you just listen to that podcast once a week, you will be better at IR debates. Um, CFR also runs Foreign Affairs, which has both a magazine and a website. Uh, the other ones is uh, the Economist's IR section is fantastic. Um, I think probably in term, given that the name implies their focus on economics, I think that their geopolitics coverage is probably the best best part of the newspaper. Um, also Foreign Policy and the Diplomat, also fantastic websites. Uh, this was the motion that we did in the debate, uh, but obviously not appropriate here. So um, that concludes um, the talk. And on that now, note, yeah, go for it. Sprenger has opened or is now open to free download a lot of its books and a lot of its journals. So if you found a cool journal today, um, or, or anywhere in the past week and you thought this was really cool and it also dealt with the Middle East, Springer is now free to download a shit ton of things. Um, awesome. So go there too. It's fun. Cool. Does anyone have, a, does anyone have any questions?
uh, or is there anything that I covered that you'd like to hear more about? We have maybe five more minutes, I think. No? You can unmute yourself, by the way. You don't have to write on the chat. You can unmute. Yeah, yeah, just unmute yourself and ask questions. Um, yeah, I had one. Mm, so you mentioned somewhere at the beginning that like certain people in Saudi Arabia are funding terrorism or non-state actors to some extent in different countries, yeah. like um, Wahhabist extremism, especially compared to Iran, how much of this is happening and sort of like how, how destabilizing of an effect does Saudi Arabian funded extremism have in the Middle East or all over the world? Uh, that's a very interesting question. So, the first thing to understand is if a terrorist organization cannot function without funds. So having guns is not enough. If your people are full-time fighters, you need to pay them wages. You need to be able to supply them with training. You need, to, if you're going to run like an insurgent group, like the revolutionaries within Syria, you're going to need like substantial resources. So that means if you're a terrorist organization or even freedom fighters, it doesn't really matter. If you're any, in any way a non-state actor, you have to turn to someone for funding. And that means you're going to turn, assuming you're, you know, Islamists, you're going to turn to either Iran or Saudi Arabia. So the question of which one is more destabilizing or which one is, you know, doing more really depends on where you're looking. So if you were looking at Syria, for example, Saudi Arabian money has been funneled quite heavily into, um, well, initially the resistance groups against the, the Sunni resistance groups against the Saudi government. Uh, so so let, let me just go backtrack a second because... So when I said that there are Shia majority and Sunni majority countries, Iran, as far as I'm aware, is the only one that's like overwhelmingly Shia. So Lebanon, I think is, I'm not 100% sure. It's a relatively even split in Lebanon, from what I recall. Um, Syria was like 80% Shia, I think. Um, if anyone knows, feel free to chime in. I can't remember these statistics off the top of my head. Um, the point is like, there was still a substantial Sunni minority within Syria. Um, and so as a consequence, and Iraq, again, I think, is, again, is also majority shy, like 80% shy. Um, so if you were looking at this from the perspective of the Syrian government, Saudi Arabian money has, also, has been incredibly, de incredibly destabilizing. If you're looking at it from the perspective of the Iraqi government, there's also belief that Saudi individuals have funded ISIS, for example. So from that perspective, very, very destabilizing. If you're in Israel, on the other hand, Hezbollah and Hamas are your biggest concerns. And at that point, Iran looks very destabilizing. Again, if you're in um, Yemen, it's unclear in the sense that Iranian weapons and Iranian money is what's supplying the Houthis and what's enabling them to continue fighting. But the Saudi airstrikes are the ones that are kind of destroying your country. So uh, there's no clear answer. Um, if you're in Yemen, you're mostly hungry. Yeah, if you're in Yemen, you probably have bigger things. Yeah, you probably have more pressing things to think about. I, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable sort of pointing the finger and saying this one is worse than this one or um, yeah, it just depends where you look. Um, globally speaking, though, Iran doesn't have nearly the kind of soft power that Saudi Arabia has. So Iran has um, like some newspapers and some out, uh, media outlets that are somewhat influential in the West, but like not nearly to the I same. I wouldn't call it soft power, do from Saudi Arabia? I'm unsure if I can tie in there, but it's more. With Saudi Arabia, we all think it's bad, but it has economically a lot of ties and newspapers in which it can... Oh, no, so what stuff. I mean is Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabian uh, funding of like religious groups in Europe is, is enormous. So large portions of Muslim communities, um, mosques, things like that, all around Europe are funded directly or indirectly by Saudi Arabian officials um, or members of the royal family or whatever. So the, the country has the ability to influence the barometer of Islam around the rest of the world to a much greater extent than Iran does. So where most of Iran's influence comes from their funding of terrorist organizations um, and, you know, engaging in asymmetric warfare through the Quds Force or whatever. Uh, they, Saudi Arabia's influence globally is less through funding terrorism and more through, you know, funding Islamic groups. Does that answer your question, Samuel, or is there anything else? Um, yeah, no, it definitely does. Um, one other question that I was curious about. I um, once read an article about Saudi Arabia, as you already mentioned, like using um, um, Mecca and the other thing um, as like a sort of foreign policy tool in terms of restricting pilgrimage from different countries to there. 
realistically speaking, how valuable is this against other Muslim country governments? And how much can you actually drive their sort of decision making? Like, is this a sort of nice thing? Or is this like a major threat against a country if Saudi Arabia restricts the amount of pilgrims that can come from there? So it's not restricting the number, it would be blockading entirely. I guess the answer is, I'm going to dodge the question a little bit, but like, hopefully you'll understand why. Geopolitics is very rarely about what you actually do. It's much more about what you could do. So when I talked, for example, earlier when I was talking about how, um, you know, Saudi Arabia controls the Red Sea and shipping through the Suez Canal, they've never like blockaded ships coming through the Suez Canal. It would be, you know, incredible for that to happen. It'd be absolutely like, it would change the face of global politics if Saudi Arabian ships suddenly blockade shipping through the Suez Canal. But that doesn't matter because geopolitics is about what you can threaten to do. So it's less that Saudi Arabia says, if you don't do X, we'll... Or it, publicly, Saudi Arabia has only used this against Iran. And um, it's not as effective, I guess, against, against Iran as it would be against other countries. Because in Iran, the population already doesn't particularly love Saudi Arabia. And so at least if, when that happens to Iran, the, you know, the government can blockade... Uh, sorry, can point to Saudi Arabia and say, they're the ones blockading you from engaging in Hajj. Blame them, not us. But in other countries, it's unclear, right? Because this stuff happens behind closed doors. They've never done this. But if you can imagine, I don't know, Qatar, for example, they had a spat with Qatar. And you can imagine in a sort of back channel meeting between two diplomats, the um, Saudi Arabian official kind of hints like, you know, we might have to stop travel into between our countries. At that point, like the fear is enormous because these countries, their populate, even if governments are in a feud with Saudi Arabian regime, the population don't have that same hostility towards the, the Saudi state. Um, and so if the Saudi Arabian government blockades travel and then engages in propaganda and like, you know, publishes news about how this is the fault of their government uh, in a situation in which perhaps they were also being economically blockaded, the combined pressure of the, the like the, the religious um, symbolism of being blocked from Hajj is enormous combined, say, with economic dysfunction, this could rapidly turn a population against their government. This is generally not something that people are willing to risk. So this is why I emphasize that we don't know how powerful this tool is because we've never seen it overtly wielded. Um, but we know that it is theoretically at least incredibly powerful and it probably features in the some more subtle decision-making. Also, if I can tie into that, um, so two minor notes. Um, I think a lot of things in geopolitics, or especially in politics in general, don't necessarily come down into uh, like ones that's what you can do. But even on that, public diplomacy and soft power, I know Kat will hate me for saying this, still matter to an extent, especially for a government that, how weird it may seem, tries to hold up a form of legitimacy or a form of we're the good guys, blocking other Muslims for doing what they perceive is the holiest thing ever and doing that as a state, and then kind of saying that your state is better than. Islamic doctrine at all is a step you may not want to be, take as a government in the first place or as a regime in those regions. So I, I just find it very unlikely they'll ever use as a tool. Like you'll you can say it as governments, like it, it can play into the decision making of this is another tool that we have. Um, but it's like having a hammer in my room and saying I could potentially smash your hat with it, even though. It's a very unreasonable tool, given the fact I have many others, and it will probably not make me look better as well. So I don't think it's something that's effectively going to be used, even as a threat, somewhere soon. That's odd. I do, on a general note, being someone who has seen a lot of opinions about the Middle East and how we perceive it when we know all these extra facts. Oh my God, that's so much war and so much hatred and... Um, so much infighting in geopolitics. One, yes. Two, uh, please note that has nothing to do with religion or the fact that people are Islamic or not, or Muslim or not, or that there's division and that it shares many similarities with many other regions in the world, and that there's many other places in the world where just as much fighting happens for similar regions with different names, or for similar reasons with different names, um, and that that's by no means very unique or very special about the region. I'm not sure I fully agree with that. I think the, I think the Middle East is definitely the most war-stricken region of the world in the status quo. Like, I can't but it has nothing to do with Islam. My point is that oh, that's no, no, not... I, I, that's why no, 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 for sure, for sure. As I was saying um, in the beginning, this is, this is not because Muslims are more prone to violence or anything like that. This is 
um, due to the historical factors. So Iraq's instability originates in the division of the country and the partition of... Um, no, but even that's oversimplicated. Um, oh, it's like, not just... Okay, like said, a, hour, okay let's, let's, like I said, this is an hour and a half lecture on uh, sure. something... Like, I'm, I'm very time. happy to discuss this with anyone, just try not to be too... Um, it's yeah. very easy to make to make biased uh, assumptions based on what you know, and I know it's 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 all very fascinating, and I actually learned a couple of things too. Um, but be careful with them because I've seen people make them, and they hurt. To every person who did Oriental or Middle Eastern studies, they hurt. I'm sure. Um, I sp actually, you know what? That's a good point. I guess this bears worth reminding. Um, this is a lecture for a debating community. Do not treat this as a like serious academic source that you should base any like real decisions on or like don't quote me in your lectures or whatever um this is this is a primer uh, this is like creating a foundation of knowledge to use in debates um and that's the extent of how you should treat this um in that said i think we have a spa in one minute so thank you all for listening uh, i see more questions and um kudos ron i've learned having... a lot of stuff actually too uh, and have a lot of new ideas for papers I would like to write or things I would like to research. So good job. Thank you, Ron. And also, Franca, and I don't know who else was speaking. I don't remember, but if... Um, Nicola and Samuel. Oh, Samuel, yeah, exactly. This lecture, probably uh, pending Ron's approval, will be so posted somewhere. So if you would like your name or something like that to be retracted, feel free to message me and I will just do that. So... Uh, no, it's fine. it. Cool. All right, uh, let's call it quits there. Yeah, thank you, Ron, very much. Um, I will send you all the posted. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, everyone.